today about the impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection in mothers uh, on their infants. So I was uh, led to believe you're not a whole, uh, whole bunch of immunologists. So I thought I'd just do a very basic introduction to innate and adaptive immunity, just the cells that I'm actually going to be talking about. So we're all on the same page. Uh, a bit of information about how the adult and the neonatal immune system are actually different. Some previous data that suggest if the mother or indeed the father are infected, that actually that may have an impact on the neonate. And then SARS-CoV-2 itself in pregnancy and the study that we've uh, recently uh, completed. So as I say, just so we're in the same page, there are two main types of immunity, innate and adaptive. So this really uh, exemplifies innate immunity. You have a cell that will take up uh, bacteria that will then uh, digest them, kill them, uh, show pieces of them to the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system, innate immune system, sorry, is known for being uh, very quick. It is there at birth. All the cells of the innate immune system are present at birth, but it is not specific. So although uh, innate immune cells will recognize bacteria, they recognize pathogen associated molecular patterns or damage associated molecular patterns. They don't recognize the bacteria specifically. And there is uh, no memory, although this is disputed in some areas of trained immunity. But so this is just a basic idea. And innate cells would be these sort of cells. So monocytes, neutrophils, they all phagocytose bacteria in this way as do dendritic cells and NK cells kill these cells directly. So this is the innate immune system. Then we have the adaptive immune system exemplified by T cells and B cells. And the difference with this really is the fact this is a specific response. So here we have our innate immune phagocyte that's eaten its bacteria and it's presenting specific peptides of that bacteria to a T cell that has an antigen receptor specific for a particular peptide. So this really is the difference. Uh, because of that, it's much slower. So basically, you need your phagocyte to eat your bacteria to then find the T cell that's uh, reactive to that particular peptide. It's not a very quick, uh, a quick part of the immune system, so it develops post-infection, but it does provide memory, which is important for the immune system. And it's thought to, well, I say develop post-birth, but I just want to clarify, these cells are all there at birth. But there's some discussion as to uh, whether the immune cells at birth work in the same way as they do in an adult. And I'm going to touch on that now. So obviously, when you're born, you've been uh, completely surrounded, uh, protected in, your in the womb. And so you haven't really experienced much infection. So most of your T cells, most of your adaptive immune immunity are naive. There's not much memory to uh, bugs that you would have already seen. But you have T cells, the majority of them are naive. You have B cells, they're not great at antibody production, but actually that doesn't matter because your mother has transferred IgG through the placenta to you. And that is how you're protected uh, at birth by maternal antibodies transferred across the placenta. But if we think about the actual T cells, and as I say, there's some debate as to whether neonatal T cells and adult T cells are the same, and actually they're really not very, very similar. This is an example of what a mother's T cell will do if you activate it. So CD4 T cells is part of the adaptive immune system. What I'm showing here is what happens if you stimulate a T cell in an adult, and then you look at the cytokines it produces. What this plot shows here, each individual dot is a cell, and depending on where you fall within this quadrant, indicates what a cytokine you are producing, or if you're not producing any at all. So what you can see quite clearly is that in the adult immune system, if you activate T cells, you get a large production of interferon gamma. And this is an important cytokine in the immune system in an adult. It's made by lots of different types of cells, actually, and it really underpins the response to many parasites, bacteria and viruses, and it can inhibit viral replication directly. It can also activate macrophages and the uh, HLA class 2 expression. So it's a very important cytokine in the adult immune system. But actually, if you activate a neonatal T cell, you get a completely different picture. And this lack of interferon gamma production by neonatal T cells led to the hypothesis for a very long time that neonatal T cells were just inactive because they couldn't make this really pivotal cytokine in your immune protection that's important in an adult. But hopefully what you can notice is that in the neonatal system, you make a lot of this cytokine, CCL8, also known as IL8. So this really changed the view of neonatal immunology from the idea that actually it was just an immature version of the adult and couldn't provide any inflammatory protection or protection against uh, 
bug straight away to the idea that actually it has a lot of potential. IL-8 is known to be involved with inflammation. It can recruit and activate neutrophils to increase their phagocytic potential. And IL-8 particularly is thought to be quite important in humans as opposed to mice because the fact that uh, human neutrophils can't respond to IL-17. Until this data, to be fair, it wasn't really associated with T cells, but it's obviously it's very clear that in the neonate, this is quite an important cytokine. Okay, so this is what we know about neonatal immunity. This is the cells we're interested in and the cytokines we're interested in as we go through the talk. So what about a parental infection? Does this have an effect on the neonate? And I just wanna highlight a few studies that have been published in this area. Looking at uh, in the human, and maternal infection with HIV or with Hep B. Now, obviously, you'll know that HIV can uh, be vertically transmitted to the child, but in many instances, this is not the case, particularly with treatment nowadays. But you do have infants born to mothers who uh, had HIV, known as HEU infants, which stands for HIV exposed but uninfected. And actually, the immune system in, this, in, in these infants is different to a normal infant born to a mother who was not exposed to HIV. There are various, various studies on this. I've just highlighted one where they show that the T cell receptor, so the T cell that recognizes specific antigen, they're less diverse in these babies, suggesting there's been some clonal expansion of some T cells, perhaps those recognized in HIV antigens. Also maternal hep B infection uh, will also drive much higher levels of interferon gamma producing T cells in the neonate. I just showed you a second ago that interferon gamma is not produced very well uh, at birth by the neonatal immune system, but it appears if the mothers had Hep B, that actually the ability to make interferon gamma is increased in the neonate. And obviously, maybe not surprising, there's a lot more uh, work done in mice in this area. It's known now that actually your mother's microbiome has an effect on the immune system of the infant, particularly these innate lymphoid cells. Infection with the cinea in a, a, a pregnant mice induces different uh, tissue responses in the infant. And actually probably one of the most interesting data sets is if the father is infected with uh, candida, this is a yeast, actually then you see an increased resistance and responsiveness of the offspring to candida, uh, not even uh, when the mother's infected. So these are all really quite interesting ideas. So what do we know about pregnancy and uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2? So initially, it's thought that pregnant women are not more likely to catch COVID, but there's a lot more information now that actually if you do catch it, particularly in the third trimester, you may be more at risk of more severe illness than someone of your equivalent age. There's a lot of uh, interest in whether preterm birth is increased in mothers who have a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And although there probably is data that that's true, that may actually not be related to the neonate itself, but more obstetricians being nervous and worried about the state of the mother and then inducing a premature birth as opposed to a, a need for the baby itself. So if we think about the baby itself, what do we know about SARS-CoV-2 infect, SARS infection? So like children in general, neonates are not particularly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And even in neonates born to mothers who have infection, either uh, in, in uh, pregnancy or perinatally, they tend not to catch it. Vertical transmission is rare, but there are case reports where it has been seen. So you can transfer across the placenta, but it's not very, uh, very common. And actually, I think it's fair to say that the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy on the mother and particularly on the offspring have not been that well documented. So this led us to our study where we monitored uh, pregnant women who, ex who experienced SARS-CoV-2 infection in the second or third trimester. And then we analyzed the effect this had on the infant. So I'm just gonna describe the study to you here because there are, there's a few different groups and it's, it's important that you understand the differences. So we have one group here at the bottom called non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed. So these are infants from whom we'd previously collected and stored neonatal cord blood who, who were born prior to the start of the pandemic. So these mothers were never exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and uh, are completely uh, naive. Then we have our SARS-CoV-2 exposed cohort. Now these mothers were separated into two groups. They were separated into a group we termed recovered. And this is because their positive swab for SARS-CoV-2 was uh, 
detected at least two weeks before birth and actually the median was 60 days before birth. So most of these mothers had recovered from their SARS-CoV-2 infection. What? Are you there? Yeah. Then, then we had another cohort, <laughs> uh, which we determined recent or ongoing. And these had a positive swab within two weeks of birth with the medium day being three days before birth. So these mothers were still infected. And from these mothers and babies, we collected blood. And then we looked at uh, antibodies, cytokines, cells, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific cellular phenotypes. So if we start in the plasma, uh, what, do, what do we detect in the plasma of the mothers and of the infants? So what we're shown here is antibody levels, specific antibody levels to different SARS-CoV-2 uh, peptides. We have IgG here, the first three lanes, and then IgM in the mother against spike protein, receptor binding domain within spike, and a nucleocapsid. And what you can see by the colors, the lighter colors are, are higher levels and the black is no levels, that there are SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies in the mothers of both the mothers with infection and those whose infection, infection had cleared. When you look in the corresponding infants to the babies, you can see IgG is present, IgM is not. So what this is telling us is that the baby's not made their own antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, implying that there's been no vertical transmission, but that the mother has successfully transferred IgG that's specific to SARS-CoV-2 to their infant. What we can see if we looked at mother-infant pairs is that actually mothers had recent or ongoing infection tend to uh, transfer less specific IgG to their neonate than those uh, that had recovered infection, even those that had high levels in the mothers. I see both of these quite high, quite high levels about, against uh, spike protein. So although uh, this is probably just really suggesting this could just be a time frame issue, but it does suggest if you want to vaccinate, it's probably better to vaccinate in a, an earlier trimester than towards the very end to ensure you get good transfer of antibodies to the infant. Now, then if we look at cytokines in the plasma, there are certain cytokines that are known to be associated with COVID infection in adults. Two of these are shown here, IP10 and IR1 beta, and both of these were significantly elevated in the plasma from the recent or ongoing mothers compared to mothers that had recovered from infection. And indeed, this correlated with when the mother was infected. So here we're looking at maternal I1 beta levels, and you can see they're much higher in mothers that had their positive SARS-CoV-2 swab quite close to birth compared to those mothers who had SARS-CoV-2 100 days plus before birth. And obviously their plasma levels at birth were much lower. So this indicates just a response to infection in the mother. When we look in the infant, we also saw some cytokines. So IP10, which I just showed you in the mother, was marginally elevated. And indeed, it, the levels of IP10 in the infant did correlate with maternal IR1 beta, which I've just showed you did correlate with infection. But you should also be aware that some cytokines do cross the placenta. So this may not be indicative of the infant making its own response to maternal uh, infection. This could actually be maternal IP10 that has transferred. But there were some cytokines we detected that were made by the baby specifically that weren't elevated in the mother. Here we're looking at IL-10. This is actually an anti-inflammatory cytokine that was expressed in those babies born to mothers with concurrent infection, suggesting the baby was trying to make an anti-inflammatory response. And also we see elevated of uh, IL CL8, the IL-8 I mentioned earlier, that's very prominent in infants. The fact this wasn't significantly different may be really related to this data set because it's known uh, that IL-8 is induced during the birth process. So all those infants born by uh, normal vaginal delivery had high levels of uh, interleukin-8 and these high levels associated with these uh, babies here. And actually, if you were born by cesarean section when your IL-8 is not necessarily elevated, the elevation was only seen in those infants born to mothers with COVID. And indeed, you can see that when you compare maternal levels to infant levels, there are significantly higher levels of IL-8 in the infant, again, suggesting that this IL-8 production was an infant response to maternal infection. And again, you can see that this neonatal level of IL-8 did correlate with maternal infection. Indeed, there's a paper just recently uh, out, uh, Garcia Flores et al, where they also looked in cord blood of neonates born to mothers with COVID, and indeed, the only significant elevation that they identified was in IL-8, otherwise known as CXL-8, corroborating our own data set. 
So what about the actual infant uh, cells? Are they affected by maternal COVID? So we did this by flow cytometry. We looked at various uh, panels to look at different populations, both the classic adaptive T cells and B cells and the innate monocytes, dendritic cells and NK cells. And by using these different panels, we could subpopulate looking at memory cells, cells that proliferated, cells that expressed different markers that correspond with activation and cells that made different cytokines. And if you do this, you can develop a, what you'd call an immune profile of each infant. And this is shown here by this principal component analysis where each dot is a uh, infant cord blood immune profile. The green dots are those born to mothers never exposed to COVID and the uh, peach and purple mothers born to uh, children born to mothers with COVID. And you can see they do seem to segregate. And unbiased clustering again seem to cause some segregation where those babies born to mothers with recent or ongoing infection here in uh, gold tended to segregate away from those not exposed to COVID or who had recovered from COVID. So what is driving these changes? Which cells are different? The first thing to say, and this has been seen by a few groups now, is that the main cell populations do not appear to be different in the infant. Here we're looking at infants uh, not, whose mothers were not exposed to COVID, who had recovered from COVID, or who had recent infection. And generally, there was not much change across the board in general T cell populations or indeed B cell populations. But we did see some changes, particularly in the innate cells in babies born to mothers whose pair, whose mother, in babies born to mothers who were positive for COVID at the time. Here we're looking at the NK population, where you can see in non SARS CoV 2 exposed you have about 30% of non-CD3 cells at NKs. And this really rapidly increases in babies born to mothers with infection. And this is shown here. Here we have uh, recovered mothers or a recovered or non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed mothers. And the levels of NK cells in babies born to mothers with recent infection is elevated. And it's not just NK cells, but other innate cells also appear elevated, such as NKTs and these V-gamma-2, uh, V-delta-2, uh, gamma delta T cells. So just to summarize on this uh, first part, obviously just to say NK cells do correlate with maternal swab date. So there is a neonatal response to maternal infection if the maternal infection is current in the fact that the cytokine levels are increased in the baby and there are some innate cells increased in the baby. But the question is really, is there any effect if mothers had COVID earlier on in pregnancy? All these responses I've shown you so far are only related to those babies born to mothers with current infection. And actually there was, here we're looking at interferon gamma expression, expressing T cells, CD8 T cells. And as I showed you, it told you at the very beginning, although uh, adults make a lot of interferon gamma, neonates tend not to make a lot of interferon gamma. And here at the non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed infants, very low levels of interferon gamma producing T cells. This does increase, however, in, in babies born to mothers exposed to SARS-CoV-2, either those that have recovered or those that have recent or ongoing infection. And this is shown here. Non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed infants had much lower levels of, of interferon gamma producing T cells than babies born to mothers who had recovered or still had ongoing infection. And actually it wasn't just interferon gamma, but also TNF, another important cytokine for uh, protection, was elevated from about 10% in non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed babies to nearly a third of uh, the T cells were making TNF in, in babies born to mothers who had experienced COVID during pregnancy. And this is, is shown here, looking at TNF producing T cells in these different baby cohorts. Again, this was seen also in NK cells and in NK T cells and in gamma delta T cells. So generally, all these cytokine producing C cells seem to be elevated. And actually it appeared that the ability of these cells to make more TNF was related to the presence of more memory. So the question really we just wanted to finish on is, is this increased cytokine functionality due to cells that are specific for SARS-CoV-2 in the neonate? Or have there been some sort of priming, if you like, of the, in the maternal state to develop these cells prior to birth to be uh, more responsive? So to measure SARS-CoV-2 specific responses, we did an L-spot assay. What you look at here, any green dot implies a T cell that's making interferon gamma in response to these different uh, peptide pools against matrix spike, different spike areas of SARS-CoV-2. 
And here we have a mother who is positive and you can see quite clearly they are expressing interferon gamma cells that are reacting to SARS-CoV-2 specifically. In the neonate, a neonate here that was making increased levels of interferon gamma in their T cells, it was not a specific SARS-CoV-2 response. And this is what we saw generally, suggesting there is no uh, transmission. However, in this, this neonate, we did see some interferon gamma producing T cells that were responding specifically to SARS-CoV-2 peptides as shown here. Again, this was just one infant. This is looking at all our infants and we're looking at how many interferon gamma producing cells they had against spike N terminus. And you can see the mothers had positive cells, the babies did not, apart from this one infant. And obviously babies born to mothers never exposed to COVID also had no specific SARS-CoV-2 responses. So this does look like in this infant, at least, there was some vertical transmission. And actually this infant was born to mother who was particularly sick and had some placental ab abruption, which may indicate how this happened. So just to summarize, there is a neonatal response to current maternal infection with SARS-CoV-2. And this can be seen in the neonate by increased proportions of the innate immune cells and also by increased cytokine production, suggesting some response to the maternal infection. But also there's a response by the neonate to maternal infection whenever that happened during pregnancy. And this suggests this was really just immune cell cytokine functionality. And this suggests some in utero priming of the infant immune system in those babies born to mothers exposed to COVID. This didn't appear to be specific because there was no real responses to SARS-CoV-2 peptides in the infants. And also, as I mentioned at the beginning, no uh, IgM, suggesting there's no vertical transmission. So maternal SARS-CoV-2 infection does leave a legacy on the immune system of the neonate. And just in my last minute, I'm just going to clarify what we're carrying on to do. And really, we're trying to assess by epigenetics, is this a long-term effect? By comparing babies born to mothers never exposed to COVID versus those that were exposed, are they epigenetically different? Has this maternal infection caused a permanent change on the neonatal immune cell to make it more able to make cytokines? We know from data we've already done, this is a methylation array, that if you look where an adult naive cell sits versus cord blood naive cells, they segregate very differently. The epigenetics is very different between a maternal and a uh, infant T cell. And maybe it is that the SARS-CoV-2 exposed infants have neonatal T cells that maybe hover more here as they progress towards a more epigenetic status of a mother. Just want to finish really by thanking the collaborators on this study. Katie Dawes did all our SARS-CoV-2 specific uh, immunoglobulin data. Tim Tree helped with the Ellispot. Rachel Tribe works in maternal health and really helped mobilize our obstetricians to collect these samples. And my lab, particularly Sarah G, who did all of this SARS-CoV-2 uh, maternal data. And I think I'm just in time, so I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. See if I can end. There we go. All right. So, Dina, thank you so much. Beautiful talk. Excellent. Interesting. I, let me start um, while people may put questions together. Let me ask, are, are you surprised as I am uh, that there's, you know, so little actual infection uh, during an entire pregnancy with a mother that, you know, was viremic for a, a month, perhaps? And you know, I guess it's saying the placenta is an amazing barrier. And I, and I ask in the context of being surprised of how true it is for AIDS, for HIV, where a mother will be, you know, chronically infected and, and, the, and the baby will not, even in an entire pregnancy, I'm astounded that HIV is not infecting a, an infant. Yeah, I mean, well, HIV does infect an infant. So that there is part. vertical... If, the, but the, most, the, mostly at birth, right? I mean, yeah. But during, but during yeah, no, birth. no, totally at birth. But but there is some vertical transmission, and other other viruses do cross the placenta. I mean, I am surprised to some extent because the placenta does have ACE two, for example, and some of the uh, the other receptors that SARS CoV two can use. And there is some data that suggests that there is some transfer across the placenta. But you know, you're right. The, there's very very little data that suggest, and all the studies that have been done of any vertical transmission, there are a few, and I say in our case, it did look like one baby did have some vertical transmission, but the mother was particularly sick and the placenta was particularly ropey. So I think in those sort of scenarios, the virus is getting through, but yeah, generally it isn't, it isn't getting through. 
which is obviously helping the baby no end. Right. So, uh, and, and is it the case that when there is transmission, is it perhaps most often at delivery, at birth, as, as it is thought to be for HIV? And, and if yeah, so, then, then would we want to be treating moms at birth, you know, with antivirals or, uh, or antibodies? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's hard to know, really. It's a bit hard to tell when exactly uh, the, the transmission occurred. I think that is that is quite likely. Although, again, there's been very little uh, when the mothers are infected, even neonates that are in the NICU, often they're not getting trans, they're not getting uh, infected at, uh, at birth or even from milk. And, and from feeding, they seem to be relatively resistant, as a lot of children are. You know, I think that's one of the big theory, one of the big uh, conundrums, really, is how resistant the kids seem to be to getting COVID in general. And that does appear to be still true in the neonatal stage. And as I say, the neonatal immune system is known to be very different. And maybe actually whatever it is that is different is actually a benefit in this scenario. And, and when neonates do get infected, do they do well as a rule, as children? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the studies I've seen, it's it's very variable. Obviously, they may get the sort of MIS, uh, you know, multi-system inflammatory syndrome that is known to happen in children. But it is rare. I think generally they do do well also in the neonatal system. If they get it, they, they do OK. OK, so we have one question from uh, Morgan Firestein. Let me read that to you. Um, so... It is. Thank you very much for your talk. Are there any factors uh, to be se severity that result in a more persistent neonatal response to SARS-CoV-2? Is there any evidence of pre-pregnancy infection and neonatal immune response yeah, that you sort of address some of that? Yeah, so I think I got the question. I mean, I, I don't know how long uh, any neonatal uh, features will last. That's one thing we're looking at to check the epigenetics. And similarly, the severity, again, that's that's hard to know. Early on, we only got mothers who were severely infected because uh, definitely in England, the initial uh, criteria, unless you were sick, you weren't swabbed. So a lot of our babies, uh, particularly our early mothers, they would have been quite sick to be swabbed in the first place. Latterly, and on the second wave, every mother was swabbed when they came in. So we knew if they had COVID or not, because they weren't all sick with COVID, obviously. So, uh, I mean, obviously, the, the baby that that had some vertical transmission, the mother was very sick, and the placenta was very sick. But we just don't have enough data, really, to be able to, to really say whether the severity was transferred to a, a neonatal response or not. It, did that answer the question? It's hard to remember the question. <laughs> yeah, I think that did, I think. So, so Eric has his hand up, um, Eric, and yeah. Hi, Dina, great talk. Um, this is a, a simple question. You may have answered it and I just missed it. I was wondering whether any of the folks in your cohorts um, vaccinated and whether there were any differences with vaccination in, in any of the results. Yeah, no, no, so I didn't mention that because this was all taken in the first wave, most of these, were, and they weren't vaccinated. Because uh, the, 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 uh, the idea to vaccinate pregnant women didn't come out early. It probably should have done, but it wasn't. There was a delay before they suggested getting vaccination if you were pregnant. So most of these are unvaccinated. And regarding whether you do better, that I don't know, because, uh, because we haven't uh, got any more samples on vaccinated women. But it would be good to know. I would imagine it probably would help, actually, because I think especially that the, the responses we see in the neonate born to mothers with recent or ongoing infection. I think, you know, if you were vaccinated, you wouldn't have that or you, your infection would be less severe. And I think you would see less effect then. But these were all unvaccinated. Perfect. Thank you. So actually on the, on the anti-vaxxer front, I mean, have there been any issues of, of vaccinating mothers, pregnant mothers? I'm sure there's hesitancy. Yeah, no, there is hesitancy. There was a lot of hesitancy at first, but they are uh, generally being vaccinated now now they're taking they weren't taking usually second trimester which is probably better for the antibody transfer anyway as, as i mentioned but uh, and also a lot of people were vaccinated before they were pregnant now because right. it's been around so long people are, are already of that age have already been vaccinated prior to getting pregnant so uh but there has the, it's been okay vaccination take up for pregnant women here actually So, and I, I guess the last thing that comes to mind is just the transmission of the cytokines to the infant is, I guess, interesting to know that that happens uh, freely almost 
Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, some cytokines are known to cross uh, the placenta, so IL-6, for example, but some, I think the IP-10, for example, I don't actually know whether it is or whether it isn't. I just can't rule it out. Right. Uh, and, the, the, you know, there's some instances where, you say, the IL-8, for example, we know that that's higher in the baby than the mother. They are making their own. But uh, it's unclear. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. 